Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC2 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And for those of you who have, thank you so much for staying subscribed. We're back from hiatus. Uh, it's the end of the year has passed and uh, CES and all that good stuff is done and over with. So uh, we can start talking about some of the cool stuff on the internet. Uh, let's go ahead and get into some of the first things, some of the things I found. Uh, over at Engadget, there's a story here and it's they've got a YouTube video a heat-sensitive solar cell could lead to much more on-demand energy. It's tough to build solar cells that capture both heat and light. Most of these multi-talented devices can't trap more than 1% of the energy they receive. However, MIT has just blown past that limitation with a prototype chip that absorbs warmth through an outer layer of carbon nanotubes. The tubing heats up photonic crystals so much that they glow with an intense light, giving an attached solar cell more energy than it would collect through sunshine sunlight alone. The technology is already efficient enough to extract 3.2% of the energy it gets, which doesn't sound like a lot, but actually it is. Uh, and MIT believes that it could reach 20% with more development. Now, 20% still doesn't sound like a lot, but when it comes to converting uh, energy from one form to another form of energy, i.e. heat into electricity or uh, sunlight into electricity, or even if you have a form of energy like uh, propane or oil into another form of energy like heat, you actually lose a lot. Uh, it's not nearly as efficient as you think it is. Anyway, um, it's not necessarily more effective than conventional technology. It's much easier to store heat than electricity. So a future nanotube-based panel could provide a lot more on-demand energy than we typically get today. And in places like uh, Arizona, where you have a lot of sunlight and a lot of heat, you can combine the two, <laughs> which would be pretty neat. You could be getting a fair amount of energy. So anyway, uh, pretty interesting. I thought I'd share it. It looks pretty cool. Definitely... Uh, Interested to see what uh, comes of it over time as they add things. Google Glass sure has its fair share of dumb applications. Uh, this is from Gizmodo. Uh, the story of this article is this firefighter is writing Google Glass apps to help save lives. But some of these projects mercifully seem to balance them out, like the apps put together by Patrick Jansen of Rocky Point, North Carolina, He's a firefighter and he's writing code to help rescue teams save time and lives. So, uh, some of the apps he's written route incoming emergency calls to Glass. Kind of neat. They provide details of where the incident is, along with maps, notes from the 911 call center, and the like, as well as a find hydrant app, which, well, speaks for itself. It helps you find a fire hydrant. Um, there are others in the pipeline too. Uh, one to uh, provide building floor plans to firefighters so they understand where they're going before they set foot inside the property. Uh, another to provide detailed schematics of vehicles so it's easier to get people out of them after accidents. You know, this is all stuff where it's, I refer to it as just-in-time information, right? So it's information that's not necessarily something that you would access very frequently. But when you do need to access it, it's just in time, like right as you get a call, you know, I need details on X, Y, Z, whatever the case may be, just in time information. And it's cool that it's being pushed to, the gla to Google Glass. That is one application where Google Glass can, in fact, act like a heads up display and you get relevant information uh, just in time. So pretty neat. Um, I'm looking forward to see what else this guy does. It should be pretty cool. From Geeky Gadgets, nine new Intel Haswell processors have been unveiled by Intel. This is pretty neat. Intel has announced the addition of nine new processors to its Intel Haswell CPU range based on its fourth generation core architecture. 
The addition of the new Intel Haswell processes offer a range of new chips for consumers to enjoy, ranging from a flagship Core i7 Haswell priced at over $1,000 to a selection of ultra-low voltage processors priced under $300 in the form of the Core i5-4360U, i5-4310U, and the Celeron 2980U. So, pretty cool. Definitely check it out. I'm, you know, looking forward to seeing all this stuff uh, show up in uh, future computers. From Mashable.com, 10 programming languages you should learn in 2014. Pretty neat. Uh, the number one language, and this is no surprise, is Java. Now, I'm not saying this. I'm a Java developer. I've developed, you know, my current job is not primarily Java, but I've been a Java developer for nearly 10 years now. And, uh, you know, it's one of those languages that you kind of have to know. It's everywhere. Regard you don't even realize where it is until you start to see it. So, uh, 2, C, C++, 3, C Sharp, 4, 5, Objective C, 6, PHP, 7, Python, 8, Ruby, 9, JavaScript, and 10, SQL. So these are all languages, uh, any computer programmer that's been doing code uh, for any period, significant period of time, you know, myself, for example, I already know over half of these, and I'm pretty fluent in over half of these, and I'm familiar enough that I can muddle my way through the rest of them. So, um, you know, for example, Java C, C++, C Sharp, and Objective C are similar enough. There's, you know, that those pretty easy to switch between. PHP, uh, I can read it. I may have to look some stuff up, but I can definitely get stuff done. Same thing with Python. Uh, Ruby, actually, my current job has a fair amount of Ruby in it. JavaScript is, uh, again, one of those languages where it's a lot like C and C++ and C Sharp. Um, SQL is, if you do databases, you need to know SQL. So, you know, there you go. For those of you who are aspiring to be programmers, these are definitely languages that, at a minimum, you need to be familiar with. So definitely uh, check this story out. It's pretty neat. From CoolestGadgets.com, a tranquility pod brings you to a whole new world of relaxation. That's right. Uh, we live in an extremely stressful environment, that is for sure. Just take a look at the number of suicide cases around the world and you get an idea of what's going on around us. So this is a little relaxation pod. Definitely check it out. I thought I'd include it simply because I'm all for, you know, at the end of a long, hard, stressful day, just relaxing and enjoying myself. Uh, from Gizmodo, 8K. Yes, 8K broadcast just took a major step forward. Back in May of 2012, the NHK Science and Technology Research Lab in Japan successfully broadcasted an 8K, uh, which is 7,680 by 4,320 pixel signal over a distance of 2.7 miles using UHF frequencies. It was a proof of concept that showed that 8K TV could be successfully delivered to televisions over the air but lacked the distance of traditional broadcasts. Wow, so less than two years later, using improved equipment and techniques, the NHK has successfully completed another test where they broadcasted 8K television over the air uh, from its offices in uh, Hitayoshi Kumamoto Prefecture in southern Japan to a receiving station 16.8 miles away without any signal loss. So 8K is basically, so basically you have HDTV, which is 1080, 1920 by 1080. You have 4K HDTV or UHDTV, uh, which is ultra high definition television, uh, which is basically four times that picture size. So basically take that 1920 by 1080 and stack two of them side by side and two on top of each other. So you basically have the equivalent of four of those HDTV screens. That's 4K. Take that 4K module and stack another four of them on there, and that's 8K TV. So really high resolution, uh, pretty awesome. Definitely check it out. 
from CNET, Hasselblad overhauls sensors with a new 50 megapixel camera. A move to an image sensor made with CMOS, CMOS chip manufacturing technology will mean more adaptable cameras. It's uh, basically digital medium format. Instead of going for more pixels, medium format digital camera maker is going for better ones. So over the last decade, much of the camera world has switched image sensors from the older CCD technology to CMOS, um, the same manufacturing process used to build conventional microprocessors. So high-end digital camera Hasselblad is switching to the same uh, process. They're planning a new flagship camera, the H5D 50C, that aside from the sensor looks like the existing 50 megapixel, 50 megapixel H5D 50. So essentially, um, you know, really super high resolution, really large sensor, and really high uh, detail and sensitivity, um, quite a bit of dynamic range. Their, you know, their previous cameras were already, if you shot raw, it was 16 bits per pixel color. Uh, you know, I imagine at a minimum this would be the same thing. So definitely uh, check this out if you are looking for uh, really high-end stuff. From Read Write Web, 12 ways to make the most of Raspberry Pi. This is a really awesome a little uh, rundown of what you can do with the Raspberry Pi. Definitely uh, check it out. It's, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi is one of those things that is great for hobbyists and all kinds of cool stuff. From Ars Technica, I ran across a story that I just thought was really neat and thought I'd include it here. Uh, putting hard drive reliability to the test shows not all disks are equal. Hitachi hard drives crush competing models from Seagate and Western Digital when it comes to reliability. So there's a cloud backup provider, Backblaze. They've uh, been doing a study on hard drive reliability and apparently Hitachi and their two, three, and four terabyte hard drives are less than 2% annually, uh, which compared to models from Seagate and Western Digital, absolutely crushes them. Uh, Western Digital is in second place. They're right around the 2.5% uh, range, which is a lot higher than uh, personally I like would, would like to see. But then Seagate is, in some models in, in years, upwards of 24%. In fact, I've noticed this myself personally. I've had a whole fleet of Seagate hard drives for my own storage. And un I've unfortunately been um, experiencing a lot of failures over the years with Seagate drives. The only saving grace with Seagate is their five-year warranty they have made good on it and replaced a lot of those drives. Unfortunately, those drives, the replacement drives have not been any better. And so I've, uh, as, as drives, and not only that, that they're no longer covered under the uh, five-year warranty. So as those drives have failed, I have unfortunately been uh, slowly transitioning my fleet over to Western Digital at, you know, fairly good expense to me. But um, you know, you'd think that drives would last longer than that, and it shows Seagate drives just do not have the reliability that uh, Western Digital and Hitachi do, at least according to Backblaze. My own personal experience has been that way as well, but uh, still pretty interesting nonetheless. So anyway, uh, that will do it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes. We're back from hiatus, so uh, start to expect to see uh, new shows uh, coming out on a regular basis. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. Thanks for watching. Bye.